All right, guys, welcome back. Welcome back. So we're going to jump in today with a fantastic person. I love her already and just love love her family as I've gotten to know her through mainly her books, although we've exchanged some messages and things. But before we jump in, usually we talk about a review of the week or something like that. So something that is a trigger for me and it's difficult and I've gotten better over the years, but something that triggers me is when I want to exude this, I've got everything under control and things are good and I got this and all that type stuff. So normally I read a review of the week at the beginning, but I don't have a review of the week. Guys, you haven't sent one in. (laughs) So let me be vulnerable and say, I don't have one. Like I'd love to make something up and say I have one, but I didn't get one this week. So if you know somebody that hasn't listened to the show, or maybe you've been a long time listener, uh, throw a review in. There's a high likelihood I'll read yours next week. I promise. <laughs> so that's me being vulnerable and sharing something that could have triggered me in the past and a, a way to work through it. So with that little triggering talk, we've got a book author with us here today. She has written, written books called Marriage Triggers, Food Triggers triggers exchanging parents angry reactions for gentle biblical responses and also parenting scripts so just some awesome books i've had a chance to read a couple of them and with that said welcome to the show amber thank you dan you and i have been talking and i've been looking forward to this day and i know that this conversation is going to be an encouragement to a lot of people so thank you for having me on You're welcome. Thank you so much for like instantly reacting and jumping on. That was great. Mm -hmm. And we pronounce your name, Leah, Amber, Leah. Mm -hmm. Short and sweet. L-I-A. Sounds like two two first names, but it's first and last. Amber, Leah. Yes. (laughs) All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. So how did you maybe grow up? And then how did you like to share a little bit about your story so that we we got a little bit of an, an idea of what makes you, you? Sure. So I grew up in California. My children actually are fifth generation Southern Californians, which is pretty rare, actually. And I, you know, grew up in a a home that was had its ups and downs, lots of really positive, wonderful things, loving mom and dad, but also a lot of dysfunction and a lot of anger, a lot of generational anger. And my parents had really not a lot of support figuring out how to do life. And eventually they did find a a solid, you know, Bible teaching church. And I grew up going to church and recognizing that God was God and I was not, but still sort of confused about what I was hearing. It looked like to love God in church and a lot of the dysfunction and anger and yelling that I experienced at home. And when I grew up, I swore (laughs) that I would never do that, right? Famous last words, that I would be a different kind of of parent when it came to some of those kinds of things. So long story short, went off to college, enjoyed uh, becoming a, a young adult and thought I would get married right away and have kids. I'd been praying to be a mom since I was a kid myself and really was looking forward to that. Well, that was taking a lot longer than I thought it would take. And, you know, my friends, I watched all my friends get married and start families and move on without me. And so I had been a high school English teacher and just thought, well, this is, these are my kids. This is what life is going to be for me. But living in Southern California on a private school teacher's salary wasn't ideal. And so I decided I was going to go back to, to school and learn how to be an administrator so that I could be a head of school someday, perhaps, or something along those lines. And so as I was working on my master's degree while working full-time, I met my husband. And that was after a series of other broken relationships. And I thought, okay, finally, it's my turn. I was 29 years old and figured this is is it. God's finally blessing me. And I knew I was going to be an amazing mom. And yet then I had kids (laughs) (laughs) and then my husband and I, after a very quick engagement and uh, marriage realized that we did not know a whole lot about each other. Like we thought we did. And so enter and cue all the triggers. And I just 
looked at my life one day and thought, really, God, I waited all this time to be a mom and a wife. And every day I wake up wondering what have I gotten myself into? And I loved my children with every fiber of my being, but I was a frustrated, angry mom. And I wasn't just a frustrated, angry mom, but I was an angry wife too. And at some point I came to my fork in the road where I realized things have to change. And so lo and behold, God got a hold of me. And I write about that in my books about how my life went from, you know, this generational curse of <laughs> anger and dysfunction into something that God would make a very beautiful story of my life from. Yeah. I love that you brought up the generational curse. That's something that we talk about and it's like, you can, you can stop that. You can change that. The, the sins of the parents will pass on because we learn them from our parents or we learn them from our grandparents yeah. who learned it from their grandparents. Yeah. You mentioned fifth generation Californian. So, yes, you know, stability and, you know, yeah. we get really good at doing these awful things. And I, and what I, what I'm so thankful for and what I hope people will have some hope about, whether it's their marriage or their parenting or any other kind of relationship where they find themselves feeling stuck is that there is no match. There's no generational curse for that is a match for the God of all generations. So no generational curse is a match for the God of all generations. There's, there's just nothing that can come against an almighty God. So we don't have to feel like, oh, this is just how it's always been. And I'm stuck like this now. I'm seeing it in myself. And now my kids are going to turn out this way too. Or this relationship that I was in before uh, had all these issues. And that means that every relationship I'm going to have moving forward will have these same issues. And that's simply not true, that God is able and he's powerful and he can break that chain. Yes, yes, absolutely. So yeah, when you're saying match, I was like, oh, I understand what you mean, like competition and God will overcome. So I'm glad you wrapped that yes. up with uh, the word I'll use is conquer. He mm -hmm. can conquer yeah. these things. So that's right. in our power, we might not be able to get through these things. Mm -mm. Nope. Couldn't do it. <laughs> Couldn't muscle through it on my own. Trying to just have a fresh start and do better doesn't work. It has to be a deeply spiritual transformation. We have to invite God into that process. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So how did you, <laughs> I, you mentioned already the short, uh, quick engagement, and then at some point kids come along the, along the way. So you're, you're going to have this perfect marriage and you're going right. to be this perfect mom. And then yep. you know, at the same, <laughs> at a time, then children enter your life and things change. Yes. So how did you, how did you realize that things might be a little bit different than what your perfect plan was. So I remember one day, you know, my husband had been in and out of work for a number of years and he got a great job opportunity on the central coast of California. So that meant moving our family about three hours North onto the central coast of San Luis Obispo. And we were going to start fresh there. I was going to raise chickens. Uh, we were going to have this amazing life. It was going to be a, a brand new start. And so as we moved to San Luis Obispo, I discovered that, you know, things don't change. Circumstances don't change. Your environment doesn't change if the dynamics within your own soul and spirit remain the same. And so we got into this situation and my husband was leaving for work every day and I was still frustrated with my life and with my, my circumstances. I felt like I was constantly on edge. I had a lot of you know, anxiety. I felt very lonely. I didn't know anybody in the town. I was on my own. And I remember my husband closing the door, leaving for work in his nice suit and tie. And I was home with three kids, four and under, and could barely breathe. I just didn't even have a second to myself. And there was still a lot of, um, angst from just the move and the transition and all the newness of it all. And I realized as I looked around the room and my three, you know, little boys, and I thought, wow, the house is a mess, even though I'm trying my hardest to keep up with it. I'm a little bit bored. I love my children, but I have nothing for me personally that's feeding my soul and my spirit. And I don't like who I am. I'm constantly feeling like I'm snapping at the kids and so on and so forth. And I remember a neighbor knocked on my door 
after I had been snapping and I just was embarrassed. And I was like, oh my gosh, I hope that this isn't someone that I'm really close to. And it happened to be a neighbor down the road who was an older gentleman, really hard of hearing. And I was like, hallelujah. He probably did not hear me just snapping at my kids or whatever. And he was returning some kind of a tool or something. And I remember shutting the door and just thinking, okay, you know, guy is not here. My husband, guy, he's at work. I'm here not dealing well with the turmoil and the chaos of my life. My neighbor just came to the door. I was more concerned about him seeing and hearing me than God, who I know is with me and watching me. And I never felt judged or condemned by God for my anger and frustration, but I started to feel some conviction about it. And so I knew that I had to sit down and start reading my Bible um, more uh, you know, steadily again. I had done that for many, many years, but with three little kids and not much sleep and a husband who worked very long hours at the time, uh, I just was overwhelmed and I wasn't making that a priority. So I sat down and I just said, I'm going to start studying about anger. I'm going to learn what God has to say about it. I'm going to study what it means to be a godly father, you know, as a, as a parent to my children. And then I'm going to do that. And I just took one thing at a time. I looked at what are my biggest triggers? Okay. Well, it's not being able to get somewhere on time. I love being somewhere on time, but with three little kids, something always goes wrong. And I'm never in the car and then I'm frustrated and there goes the whole, you know, shebang. So Amber, get practical. Okay. Put a shoe basket by the door. It's the shoes that are always missing that you can't find. Put a shoe basket by the door. Get, get practical and systematic to relieve some of those things. But then also, Amber, you are a coach. You're not just a, right now you're parenting the aftermath of conflict or even conversations with your husband are always in the aftermath of conflict. It's here's this problem. Here's this trigger. And then there's no real movement forward toward a better response. It's just chaos all the time. And so I had to get to a place where I realized I needed to be proactive instead of reactive. And as a coach, I was going to, you know, what do, what do great coaches do, Dan? You know, they don't, they don't just expect someone to show up on day one and be perfect and know exactly what to do. And they get a gold medal around their neck, right? No, we evaluate our players or our performers and we see what their skill sets are. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? And then we put things in place with which to help them strengthen those things that they're already good at and to help them work through their weaknesses. And we do that with practice and practice and practice and practice and modeling. And then there's the day of performance where everybody knows what the expectation is. If you perform at this level, you do this thing, you get this prize. If you don't, here's the consequence, right? And everybody's clear on that. And then we can help work through those things and move forward. And we just sort of show up as parents and in marriages and expect that there won't be conflict, there won't be triggers. And then we try to deal with them in the aftermath of that instead of being proactive. And so I realized I had to get proactive instead of reactive. And I needed to also have a transformed heart of patience and willingness to work through these things with my kids and with my husband and not to keep repeating the madness over and over and over again. Any other triggers? Lots of triggers. <laughs> Lots of triggers. There's 31 of them in both of those books um, because they're the most common things. And, you know, Dan, this whole ministry within me and in my own home started with me. And eventually I would start, you know, a, a mom blog and then yeah. a huge ministry that resulted from this. And then, you know, books on this subject. And God has, of course, brought beauty from ashes with this whole thing. But I've worked with thousands and thousands of families through these issues uh, that we're talking about. And what was so good for me to realize is I thought I was the only one struggling with these things for so long. And the beautiful truth is, is that there's many of us who struggle, but we don't have to struggle alone. And so there are many triggers. It's, you know, talking back it, as far as parenting goes, it could be a messy house. It could be coming home from work and you're, and the house is a mess. And you're like, what just, what's been going on all day, right? Like uh, I left and it was somewhat neat and tidy and here I come and it's a disaster again. It could be um, even just your own physical exhaustion, not getting enough sleep, your own physical needs are not being met. It could be that you um, are addicted to sugar and that's not helping matters because now you have this dopamine cortisol loop in your body 
and you're not as emotionally stable as you could be if you were eating clean. It could be um, your own past and background, right? And how you relate to people. There's so many different triggers that we cover and, and talk about and all of them are relevant. And most of us have a lot of different triggers that we're facing. And the key is to take them one at a time and to not get overwhelmed. I say overwhelm is a choice. So for me, I'd start with one or two triggers, examine what are the times when I get most angry, most upset, most discouraged, and then really kind of reverse engineer. Why? What's going on? What just happened? And what's what would the opposite of this look like? And is it something practical I need to employ? And also what's the attitude that I have right now that maybe God needs to change and transform? And Proverbs 29, 11 says, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. And one of the first steps I think for a lot of us is to recognize that we've been fools and to confess that and then to get quiet and to just take some deep breaths and to stop in the moment so we don't keep operating in the same pattern of being quick to anger, quick to respond, but slowing down and not even having a conversation right then in that moment. I think as parents and as with our spouses, we're so quick to often want to just deal with something right then and right there. And yet we're highly emotional. Our spouse is highly emotional. Our children are highly emotional. I don't know about you, but I'm not real receptive or coachable or teachable when I'm highly emotional. I need time to regulate my emotions again and even just my breathing and my body so that I am receptive. So there's some practical things we can do. But I think starting with the fact that we don't need to give full vent to our spirit, that we can just take, take a holy pause, I like to call it, and breathe, physically breathe, do some deep breathing, you know, count to 10, get regulated again before we have these conversations with others. I love that little phrase, a holy pause. Mm -hmm. So I often just refer to it as taking a quick breath and looking up. You know, exactly. oh yeah, you're with me. Let's do this. Help me out. Whatever, whatever the thought is after that, it's always more productive than just keep charging ahead. That's right. We had uh, you mentioned coaching, and I'm not sure if you were talking about way back when your kids were little. If you were an actual coach at that time, or if you were talking no. about okay, you're just, talking. I'm about, just wearing as, the hat as a yes, mom as yeah. coach, right? Yeah. Like our, our job yeah. title as parents also includes coach. Coaching so like we need That's the coaching right. guide and lead our yes. kids to to good outcomes and, right. and good patterns, behaviors, systems, ways of thinking, ways of having their own holy pauses, uh, creating right. holy moments is another uh, way of thinking of things. So yes. I had a softball game the other day and I'm coaching the the team. I got a, these 10 year old girls, super sweet. They try hard. They're doing pretty well in the league and we're playing this game. It wasn't supposed to be a high pressure game at all. I thought we we're going to blow the other team out. Well, they got a new pitcher and a new catcher from the last time we played them, and both were all stars. Wow! And the coach I remembered was a queen bee, like ready mm -hmm. to attack everything, and also doesn't know the rules of softball. In addition, so she's ready to fight over every little thing because she's right and everybody else is wrong. And anyway, it was it was a cooker situation. We're down to the last inning, and my pitcher. I notice on the mound she does something super nervous. She kind of step rocks back and forth about three different times before she throws her pitch and she'd just walk the bases or uh, walk two batters. And I'm like, Oh no, she's yeah. in a dark place. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. She's always calm, cool, collected. I never have to worry about her. She just does her thing. And you know, if it's a ball, it's a ball. She just moves on next pitch. But right. it was the first time I ever seen her nervous. She threw that one a ball. She threw one more ball, walked the bases loaded. And so I called time, ran out to the mound, Got all my infielders to come in. She's, you know, shorter than me. I'm short, but she's shorter than me. And she's right underneath my chin, and I don't even look at her. I talk to the infielders. I'm like, all right, where's the play? Uh, it's every base coach, bases are loaded. Like, all right, so you're the first baseman. You're going to hit first or throw it home, one of the two. You're going to cover the base. Yeah, 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 coach. We got this. We know how to do this. Okay, perfect. We know how to do this. All right, we're going to go do our jobs. I pat the pitcher on the head and say, go get her, kid. Walk off. 
And the pitcher was looking at me like, aren't you going to tell me something? Yeah. And we didn't discuss any of that, but she needed to just have that holy pause, that pattern interrupt. That's it. Oh, we're all just going to go do our jobs. Okay. I'll do my job. Exactly. Pitch got out of the inning. Everything was fine. The tension went Mm -hmm. away, you know, all that. So good, Dan. So good. Perfect example. You know, I come off and like, what'd you tell her? I'm like, I didn't tell her anything. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. You just need, just need that moment, that little bit of a break, right. To get out of that funk that we're in. So that same thing happens in our own families when things feel, ah, um, Mm -hmm. in your, in your book, didn't you also say, Hey, I need you to go to your room for a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, I think that depends on, on, um, on the dynamics in the family, their ages and the kids. Right. So like, I think, you know, isolating can for some kids be really, uh, traumatic. Right. And we, we wouldn't want to do that, but sometimes I will tell my kids, I just need a break. You know, I'm just going to go outside for a few minutes and catch my breath. And that would be okay with them. They, that would not alarm them or concern them. Um, or even, you know, I know that one of my kids that would not work well with him. He, he would be really devastated by that, you know, to be separated. He actually would need me to sit with him. And we would take a holy pause together, you know, on the couch or whatever, and just breathe and be calm and quiet for a minute. He'd need a little wet washcloth, you know, to wipe his face, something soothing. He would need that physical touch. Um, So it's just a matter of also knowing your children, you know, another kiddo definitely would want to just go let off some steam by himself, you know, in Mm -hmm. his room and him take a holy pause there. So it's really about also being a student of your um, of your children, right. And, and your spouse and what are their needs and what's the best way to communicate and meet their needs. Because really the object of all of this shouldn't just be like punishment or just, I just want peace, right. It's for their good. We, 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 every trigger is an opportunity is what I say. It's a, it's an opportunity for us to grow and for our children. Um, it's an opportunity for us to learn about our kids. It's an opportunity for us to grow in patience as parents and as spouses it's an opportunity for us to get to know people better in our under our own roof and to see how they operate and what they need. So we can either personalize these triggers and get all offended and make it about us and turn into a victim ourselves, or we can go, oh, this is just a signal. It's a signal that there's still some maturing that needs to be done in my child. This is a signal that my spouse and I, my wife and I, my husband and I are not quite on the same page here. I thought we were, but we're not. And so what can I do in a proactive way, not a reactive way to have better communication about this? And how can I yield myself in this situation? How do I get to serve my spouse in this situation as opposed to going to a place of self-pity? Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. So that was kind of how we got connected. One particular week, I do a great job. At least I feel like I do now compared to what I used to do of not um, reacting to things that my wife says. I came up with a little phrase, uh, respond, not react. So whenever I get ready to react, oh yeah, wait, holy pause, respond, not react, respond, not react, respond with love, not react, not react with anger. That took a long, long time, but eventually I got pretty dang good at it. And then one particular week, three different times, I had something short to say with my wife. And I was like, what the heck is going on? I understand it happened once. Yeah. Like twice. What the heck was that? And the third time I'm like, honey, I'm just so sorry. Like this is, I don't know what's going on. I I apologize. Yeah. But as I'm in it within a short while, I realized, oh, it was and you, you read off your list, lonely, no time to self, uh, house is a mess, uh, <laughs> addicted to sugar. <laughs> like right. maybe I didn't have sugar. I've been doing pretty good with trimming that out, but at the yeah. same time, it's a battle. It's a total yeah. battle. Um, but yeah, the, the tired lack of sleep, physical stress. So one of the ways mm-hmm. for me to work through things mm-hmm. is to go work out. Yeah. But when you push your body too far, and you're physically worn out in addition to mentally worn out, these things, um, you know, can, and then add some work pressure to things and like, okay. Yeah. Too much. (laughs) feels like too much, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then when you keep some things like that away from your spouse where she doesn't know, 
they've mm-hmm. got a bunch going on or hasn't done the mental math to add up that all these different things are happening all at the same time. Hey, yes. you could use a break. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, you could, you could use some time to go hang out with the guys. Hey, you should grab a book, maybe right. a big one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> with a whole yeah. bunch of little chapters in it, a whole bunch of little books in it. So yes. yeah, I love, love that you recognize that in your own life was, Hey, I need to get mm-hmm. back into the word. Yes. It's sure. easy to work ourselves out of good habits when things are running hot, running fast. Right. Exactly. And, you know, it, it, it wasn't working for me to try to figure it out and start over without the word of God. You know, it, that's, what's living and active in your life. That's, what's going to really transform your mind and your heart is it's by the renewing of your mind through the washing of God's word that's going to cleanse us and have, have us moving in a better direction. And I knew that if I didn't prioritize that, um, you know, that, that it was just going to be in my own effort and I could change a little bit, um, for a short period of time, but I wasn't looking for short temporary change. I wanted lasting change so that I could live life to the fullest as God designed and my kids could, and my husband could, and they would have to make their own decisions about their own walk with God and their own reactions or responses to their triggers. But as far as it depended on me, I was going to live at peace with everyone. And that required a heart transplant on my part. And even when my child or my spouse still has a challenging moment, that challenging moment can be a victory for me, even if it's not for them. And that became me taking radical ownership and being courageously committed to the truth that I had no excuses or reasons or triggers that would justify my own sinful behavior. And so this had to be for me taking a very honest look in the mirror and saying, I am only responsible for me. I I am called to steward my children well and to be an example to them and to point them to Jesus. But at some point I can't take too much credit or too much criticism for the decisions and the choices that they will make. And I certainly can't do that for my spouse. So this had to be Amber. Um, You have this one life to live and this is your moment with which to decide, are you going to get serious about this and deal with this or not? And it took about a year for God to work in me and to really transform me. And then as this became a ministry and a book and, you know, speaking all over the country and doing things like that in in relation to helping parents primarily initially, so many people would say to me, Amber, this is helping me a lot in my parenting so much, but I'm also seeing the benefit of it in my marriage because as it's transforming you, it doesn't just affect one relationship. When you become transformed, it affects all of your relationships, but they would say, I, but still, I'd really love something specific, you know, for marriage. And so that's how marriage triggers was born as a result of that. And I was super resistant to it because I had had a very difficult marriage and I didn't want to revisit that. And I feel like, you know, God always has me transparently writing about these different seasons of my life and things that are even ongoing. You know, I'm not writing from a place of I've arrived in any of these areas. This is, I'm still on this journey. As long as we've got kids, as long as we're married, as all these, we're going to be ongoing and dealing with these and growing in Christ likeness. But I knew that God was calling me to again, examine my own heart. And that's what marriage triggers became for me as well is Amber, how can you stop justifying your sin because of your spouse's sin? That each of these triggers is another opportunity for you to grow and to be more like me, regardless of what your spouse does or doesn't do. So I like that you brought up a spouse and kids. They'll do things that we get angry about, triggered about, uh, just flat out disappointed. Like, are you kidding me? They did that again. Like, I think I picked up seven socks when I walked up the stairs today. I'm like, are you kidding me? (laughs) And I know these have been here for two and a half days. Tell us 
offense and how sad that it's not even eight. It's it's just always that one random missing sock, right? The seven, nine, ten. Oh my gosh, totally. I'm like, uh, I'll just pick them up and I'll put them in the hamper. It's literally as I'm walking up the stairs, I can pick up all seven. I can walk right to the hamper that's right in front of the stairs and just yeah. put them there. Like, not a big mm-hmm. deal. But mm-hmm. like at the same time, on a different day, <laughs> there could be a whole different reaction about that. Right. Everybody's asleep. Yeah. Let's wake them up and cause a commotion. Yeah. Is it worth it? I mean, that's one of the questions I ask myself often is, Amber, is is it worth it for you to fight this fight and win this battle? Or is it more worth it for you to carry your cross on this one? And, you know, Jesus's example to us is loving sacrificial service to one another. And that's very much different. You know, I, I, I will, I just want to say, I will never advocate any kind of abusive situation, right? Like we can, we can die to ourselves to a play in a, in such a way that we're dying because we're being inappropriately oppressed or abused. And that is never okay. And that should be dealt with, with counseling and professional help and not alone. But for a lot of these situations that I write about, it's just those everyday things like you just described, right? where we have an opportunity to lay down our lives for the sake of others. And, and then also if it gets to a point where it's like, but also this is a coachable moment, right? Like I will do this now out of loving sacrifice, but clearly we need another little family meeting about what are our values. We always do more than what is expected in the Leah home. We always do more than what is expected. Um, We always outdo one another in showing honor. That's what we do. That's who we are. And so, hey, guys, here's a great example of how we can continue the legacy in the Leah household of doing more than what is expected and always outdoing one another and showing honor. And it's with the socks, <laughs> you know, it's the laundry. And, and here's the thing. If we can't shape our, you know, if we can't deal with these things now with our spouses and grow in this area now with our children, like, how are we going to become a, a church and a body of Christ that can handle future persecution, right? Like, if we can't a- allow ourselves to be, quote unquote, die to ourselves with these little things, then the level of our spiritual maturity has a, a lot of work to do. Because we may be called to much more significant um you know, callings to sacrifice and to live a life that is worthy of our calling in Christ. And if we can't do that in these everyday things amongst our families and our with our spouses, then I'm concerned about what kind of church we're going to be down the road. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So there's a number of different things that I love. You you spoke about the the house is a mess one. I think a lot of guys especially can relate to that and you being the mom often get the brunt yes <laughs> some guys true. you know dan i tell you i'm the one that does all the cooking all the cleaning all the dishes i do 100 percent everything my family doesn't do anything like uh come on man right i, I appreciate the great victim and you know throw you up mm. on the cross kind of thing however uh, it's probably not the the accurate story for one uh, but right. secondly, let's discard that man. <laughs> yeah. fall, fall on those beliefs. Uh, we're, we're not going to talk to you right now. Let's talk yeah. to the to the rest of mm-hmm. the rest of the guys, the ones that yeah. the house does have, you know, some stuff around a little bit to what degree, whether it's a, a model home ready to show to sell the house or whether it's one with a reasonable level of of mess. And then it goes beyond that. And yeah, sometimes the husband's. I've got my own thoughts and I've been guilty in the past, but mm. as the, as the mom speak, speak mm-hmm. to the husbands that yeah. say, here's, here's our side. Here's the mom's side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Here's, so, here's you know, what we'd like. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and I think that that's the key, Dan, is the communication piece is one thing, right? Like, again, it's one thing to come at someone with criticism in the aftermath of seeing a situation like the house is a mess. And now I'm going to like, talk about it. I think it's really important to have these conversations outside of conflict, right? At a time when you're making time with your spouse to come together, hopefully the spirit of both of you is, I want to meet with you regularly to talk about things that matter to me and that matter to you. And I want to do that with openness and curiosity without criticism and blame. 
so that we can find a win for all solution, right? Not a compromise where you lose some of what you want and I lose some of what I want, but a win for all solution to get creative. If we have the God of the universe who has all wisdom and promises to give it to us generously without finding fault, surely we can come to some terms that are gonna be relatable and understandable for both of us, even when it comes to a messy house, right? So <clears throat> it's really, again, carving out that time to talk, whether it's you have a standing you know, coffee together every Saturday morning while the kids are asleep, and you're out on the back patio and you're like, okay, this is it. Like you can now lovingly tell me something that you would, would is matters to you that you would love to see some improvement in and vice versa. Right. And it's not like a tit for tat, but it's just that openness of, I want to love you at well and serve you. I want to understand you well. And I want us to come to a place where we're both really hearing one another. And I think it's important in those moments to be mindful of what the story is that you're telling yourself, because we can make up all kinds of stories about what's going on when we come home and the house is a mess. Um, one story we could tell ourselves is I'm at work all day working really hard and she's here and she's, the house is a mess and she hasn't thought about me or my concern or my need for peace and quiet or my need to have, you know, dinner on the table or whatever. And I think also the stories um, that we could tell ourselves um, are again, rooted kind of in our past and our expectations that we haven't even verbalized or communicated well with our spouses. So again, that, that clarity, but it is really difficult to, if you have kids in the home and you know, your spouse is home with them to stay on top of things. Um, sometimes it's just like, okay, I feel overwhelmed. I've got all these things going on for guy and I, our roles reversed. Um, he was the uh, breadwinner early on in our marriage. And then for a lot of our marriage after that, it was me. And he was working with the kids, you know, and maintaining the home. And he realized how difficult it was when he, he the, the tables were turned and understood. And so it's really also about, okay, well, are our kids at an age when they could chip in and be doing more? right? Because so often we don't even track with the maturity and the ability of our children to help out around the house. And so maybe it's a team effort, but I really feel that household duties should be a team effort. We have a lot of churchical, that's a, a word I coined, a churchical <laughs> ideas of what roles should look like and who should do what. And if you like a very traditional setting and that works for you and you're both in agreement on that, great. But I am living in a world now where I see a lot more partnership and things that have to do with the house. And I think that's a beautiful thing and not allowing some of those stereotypes to take over and for us to tell ourselves stories about what's acceptable and what's not, but jump in, you know, have some understanding, have some compassion, have a, a, a very open and curious conversation about what's it like for you at home when I'm gone. Tell me a little bit about this. And, and could we, again, find some win for all solutions together so that this is better. Oh, guess what? We both need to put together some systems in place for our kids to step up and do more of the work around the house too. It shouldn't just be all on one person. You know, there could be a number of different things that you would discover, um, but being open and curious, having a discussion, working through some things. And honestly, whenever you come to a, a place where there's just not um, agreement, where there's trouble and conflict and it becomes a seed of bitterness and these little foxes. I think people wait way too long to go to counseling or to talk to church staff about these things and to get some guidance and some help. And so I always think that that's good if you're sort of at the end of the road together and you're not sure where to go from there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the mess thing, I comes home from work. You mentioned you know, he needs control. He needs order. He needs peace. He needs the food on the table, hot, ready to go. <laughs> Some nights I feel that way. And yeah. maybe work was difficult. Maybe you got cut off five times on the way home from work and you're angry. So yeah. one quick thing, guys, before you walk in the door, pause. Uh, yeah. We've been using the word holy pause. So pause, check yourself. How do I feel? What am I thinking? Am I going in angry already? Yeah. So if you can back Very off good. that and do something mm -hmm. different, whether that's say a prayer, whether that's call a buddy the last five minutes mm -hmm. of the ride home, but getting out of that thought pattern so you don't walk in red, yeah. hot, angry mm -hmm. uh, type thing. And then secondly, if you see the house is absolute disaster, how do you think your wife's day went? Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Exactly. <laughs> hey, I'm here to make your day worse. Right. So good, Dan. And we always say in our house, if you see a need, fill a need, right? Like, again, this is where the creativity and, and being open and curious could come into play. What if when dad came home, instead of being angry and frustrated, he did exactly what you said, Dan. He saw the, he, he sc scopes out the situation, realizes what kind of a day his wife must have had. And then it's like every day for the first 10, 15 minutes when dad is home, it's dance party time, right? Like yes. you got some fun music on and everybody's chipping in. Okay, so-and-so you got this corner. I'm going to do this corner. Mom's going to do this corner. And it's like, we can't wait for dad to get home to help deal with the aftermath of a very busy day with kids. And so now we're all going to chip in together and it's going to be fun. What if we made it fun instead of threatening? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Or, Hey honey, you know, how was your day? I was thinking I might, you know, throw some brats on the grill real quick and cook them up for the family unless you had other plans. Absolutely. So good, Dan, you know, but just, move that conversation so you can get to the quiet coffee time. That's it. Hey, mm -hmm. I noticed a few times this week, it seemed like when I got home, things were, you know, a little, little different than our ideal. Right. You know, what's going on this week? Is there anything we could do to make that better? Oh yeah. All this exactly. stuff was going on. Yeah. This week, yeah, it's just yep. three different random things that all occurred that aren't no pattern and nah, yeah. next week I think will be better. Great. Or Great. Eh, actually, here's what's going on. Like I need to go out with the girls. I need to yeah. go for my morning jogs. I, I need a little Bible time before the kids wake up or we need to get to bed a little bit earlier or, you know, whatever it is, but, oh, okay, great. Yeah. How can we make that happen? Exactly. Um, Proverbs 15, 18 says that a hot tempered man stirs up strife, but he yeah. who is slow to anger quiets contention. Right. And so we get to decide on the way home from work every day. Are we going to be the one who's going to stir up more strife or are we going to be the one that quiets contention? And everybody gets to decide what they're committed to. And your actions and your words are what will demonstrate, you know, what you're committed to. And so making that offer, Dan, to throw some meat on the barbecue is clearly someone who is slow to anger and is looking to quiet contention and then to have communication. You know, there's, there's no good that can come from cutting your nose off to spite your face. I say in marriage triggers that there's nothing your anger can do that love can't do better. And so it, it, always choosing to love is the better path. Yes. Yeah. When you, when you start from that mindset of how can I respond out of love? It's a better mm -hmm. answer. It's a better answer. Your, and it your requires words, humility. It yes. requires humility. You know, it's not easy to do. I know. And that's why you can't do it on your own. You know, we need to invite God in to that process. So you and uh, you and guy didn't have the perfect marriage. And I love that you're open about that. We are. Yes, we, we, um, I married Mr. Wrong and he married Ms. All Wrong. And, um, that was very apparent from very beginning stages. And so then we had a decision to make, you know, how are we going to navigate this? And again, that was when, um, we, you know, I had to decide, are these triggers going to tear us apart or, um, am I going to let God do the work in me that he needs to do in me so that these triggers are opportunities for my growth and not um, something that the enemy will use to destroy me and to destroy our family. And, you know, it takes it takes two. Um, your marriage will only be as healthy as the unhealthiest person. And I did not want that person to be me. And so I had to commit to doing the deep work with the Lord to make sure that my heart and mind were in the right place and to confess my part in that and to ask the Lord to help me um, because he says that he does not give us a spirit of fear, but instead it's a spirit of, um, of power and of love and of a strong mind or self-control self-control. Yeah. And so 
you know, if I have this spirit within me, it doesn't matter what the triggers are. Um, I can have the power and the love and the self-control. I already have it with which to do the next right thing. And the more that two book, two people are committed to doing the next right thing, then you can't help but have the kind of marriage that God designed. And so you're going to have your own unique personality. Your spouse is going to have their own unique personality. But the moment you said, I do, it's a match made in heaven with its own unique marriage personality. And so that's a good thing. But we have to learn to take each of those unique quirks and things and see them in light of God's love and do the work on our part between us and God to be that person that quiets contention, that sacrificially loves, and that has self-control, even if there's chaos around you and there's none of that being modeled for you. It's up to you to do that work personally between you and the Lord. It's nobody else's fault. So you being Miss All Wrong and him being Mr. Wrong. Yes. Our previous guest that was on, uh, he had an alcoholic father, alcoholic mother, and just rough childhood as well. And um, he says, as an adult, he went to see the counselor and the counselor says, you've got this expectation of what you want and the mm -hmm. ideal parent and all that type stuff. And the fact is you don't have that. And the fact is you never will. You can't go backwards. Right. You can't change the one that you have right now. So you can either live in this world where you're constantly frustrated or just accept what is yeah. and move forward through that. So like mm -hmm. you were talking about um, your kids or your, your husband throws some stuff at you and you're like, okay, this is an opportunity for me to grow and learn and love Yeah, and accept that it wasn't ideal. However, right. The piece you get to have is that control over your thoughts, your reaction, your pattern, your thinking, yeah. as opposed to lashing back at, out at them or thinking, hmm, how can I get back at them? Mm -hmm. How can I mess them up later, now or later? But I'm going to mess yeah. them up. I'm going to get them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And and the, the beautiful thing about this journey for me is that what I thought for a long time is that in order for me to be happy, in order for me to live life to the full, in order for me to thrive and to love my life, I needed to have my kids do and act and behave a certain way and my husband to do and act and behave in a certain way. And so I was giving all of my power, all of my joy, all of my peace to them and to what they would do or not do. And so as erratic as my emotions were, depended on the unpredictability of whatever others would say or do. And so it was a constant roller coaster. And what I realized is that I had made my family life an idol. I was only okay as long as I could fix their problems or control them, or as long as they were doing what I wanted or needed or deemed appropriate. And so as long as that's the space that I lived in mentally and emotionally and spiritually, I was in turmoil. And instead, the Lord needed to remind me that there is nothing that can satisfy me beyond himself. And it is only in my personal relationship with the Lord that I'm going to find true joy and contentment and satisfaction and peace. Now, my family can make it harder or easier for me to get to that place in many ways because we live real life, right? But at the end of the day, I had to recognize that this is about me and my relationship with the Lord and the love I feel from him and my willingness to be like him. And when that is your core truth and purpose in life is to love God and to love others, and just to receive his love for you, his total satisfaction in you, nothing else matters. Certainly not how many socks are on the stairs. That is not, there's no power in that to dysregulate me or to make me angry when my heart is so full and at peace because of what the Lord has done for me. And that takes intention in developing your relationship with the Lord personally. 
like all relationships, it requires time and investment and intention. And so that's where the path has to begin toward responding and not reacting is a total peace and satisfaction and lack of selfishness. Um, and also expecting that any person, place, thing, position can fill the hole or be what you want or need it to be outside of Christ. Nothing lives up to that standard. Yeah. So this last week was about the most stressful week I can remember in my life. Like if there was an area of my life that didn't have some higher level of stress, a uh, couple areas in particular that were just 10 out of 10. And as people would say, Hey, how's your week going? <laughs> I try to be real with that answer as opposed to, Oh, it's mm -hmm. great, man. Thanks mm -hmm. for asking. It's great. Unbelievable. If I were to be any better, I'd have to be twins, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, it's been one of those weeks. And the great thing about this week is that every hour or two, I've had a great opportunity to go, God, I'm sure glad your burden is light. Mm -hmm. I got something else to hand to you right now. Would you take it? Yeah. I, I can't, I, I can't carry this one right now. Need your help. Good. And literally every hour or two, there was something new, mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. that stressful softball game that I showed up to. The coach started yelling right off the bat, started yelling at the fans. I'm like, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this easy game <laughs> turned into a high stress uh, environment mm -hmm. and the, the loneliness, the solo, you know, the assistant coaches weren't there that game either. So we brought some other guys in to help. And anyway, all that stuff where you're like just piled on and on and on. And so rather than get overwhelmed with emotion, it was, Hey, thanks God. <laughs> I know you're here. You've been taking care of stuff all week. Could use some more help during this game as well. Yeah, that's you've, right. You've been fantastic, smiling, just answering questions, sharing things. You've also had kind of a, a challenge in this season of life right now. And I don't know what it is, but I don't know if you want to share in your, like this week, this month, this couple of months, whatever's going on that you've alluded to a little bit on social media, but maybe just the, whether you want to share what it is, or if you want to share, maybe you're thinking through it and the, the benefits that you've got going through this season. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just in a season of bearing a lot of other people's burdens too, besides my own. And, you know, when the Bible tells us, you know, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, when you're carrying a lot of burdens, it's it's a burden, right? Like it's it's it can be overwhelming. The And I think what I'm, experiencing too is just that um trusting that the i think the biggest thing i'm seeing right now in my own life and with those that i'm close to that are going a, walking a hard road right now are is that we so are reluctant to bring the things that are hidden and dark into the light and it's only by things being brought into the light that they lose their power over us and it takes a lot of courage to bring the things that are in the dark into the light. And so right now I'm walking down a path with my arms linked with others who are trying to be courageously committed to the truth and to walk in the light. And sometimes that means, you know, putting in place really healthy but solid boundaries um, with those who want to stay in the dark. And that's a hard path to take. So, you know, like everybody, um, we're always going to be facing the next trial or test, right? There, there are seasons where we walk through valleys and seasons where we were we were enjoying the vistas on the mountaintops, you know, and I think that for all of us, it's just important to have compassion for even authors, you know, even people that have navigated a lot of interpersonal work that there's, God is always up to something in everybody's life. Everybody's going through some measure of a, of a hard thing. Um, and so I'm very transparent, you know, I have this, um, 
hashtag right now, Sunrise with Amber, where I'm just doing a small devotional for people who are feeling crushed in spirit, you know, and who need a little bit of hope. And so just writing in that vulnerable way is as much as we'll get to at this point. But um, it's important to just know that for a lot of people, there's a lot of hard things they're going through in private. And sometimes it's important to bring those things to the light, but it takes a lot of courage to do that and to say, this isn't okay anymore. And I'm going to be courageously committed to the truth. And I'm going to be humble and teachable in this moment, but also, um, I, there comes a time when the darkness um, is no longer meant to stay in the darkness. <laughs> and so that's a hard thing to do. And so that's kind of what I'm navigating right now. I know it's somewhat vague, but um, yeah, yeah, no, key, yeah, 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 <laughs> respect privacy and everything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think what I take from that is that sometimes, uh, even though maybe you have the answer, maybe you trust God you know, you're, you're praying every day, you're at, you know, being thankful, thanking God for things you're asking for, you know, you're doing the things, Yeah. but that doesn't, it's not a snap your fingers type thing. No. Yeah. It doesn't always mean that things get fixed. Sometimes it means that you come to the place where you recognize that there's going to be a different outcome than the one that you've hoped and prayed for. And as you become stronger in the Lord, he gives you the courage to face that path too. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think for people that are working through something, they haven't figured it out. They haven't figured out the, the magic answer or things haven't been revealed to them. And sometimes things don't get revealed to us. Like it's we're true. not, we're not meant to know everything that God knows. If we knew everything that God knows, I don't think we could handle it. That's quite a big burden. Absolutely. And we're, as you mentioned earlier, <laughs> that you learned in your young adulthood, I'm not God. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> and as funny as that sounds, that's what we do sometimes is we make ourselves in that spot of God. We have those idols. We make our sense of self-importance about us. We come home from work and we yell at our wife or be frustrated with our wife because the house isn't clean or whatever it is. And we're making it about us, not about love and, yeah. and family, community, team, not, a, you know, certainly not saying a prayer to God for help or any of that type of stuff. So um, realize those moments where we make ourselves so important, where we need to make ourselves less important and make it more about others. Right. Exactly. You hit the nail on the head, Dan. <laughs> all right. Well, fantastic. Well, I loved having you on. We didn't <clears throat> hardly at all d- dive into food triggers, but I think that one's going to be an excellent book. I've checked out a few Thank things you. where you've spoke about the book or typed about yeah. the book. Mm-hmm. I haven't read that one yet, but that one sounds like a topic a lot of our listeners could check out as well. Yes, that's that's a my own personal health journey, which was kind of the next stage of my life most recently. I'm releasing 85 pounds and keeping it off. I'm going into my fifth year in that health journey and, um, you know, became a certified health coach as a result. And that's just a whole other ministry that's really foundational, I think, to a lot of these other issues we talk about. So, um, yeah, there's a book out, Food Triggers, and there's a a video teaching course um, related to it as well on my website. So I love that you use the word, uh, was it released? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> as, as opposed to lost. You, that's right. Mm-hmm. So a good friend of mine also uses that. She said, I didn't, I didn't lose that 225 pounds. No, I don't want to find it again. I, I know exactly it. where it went. I released it. It's gone. It's not coming back. <laughs> yeah. So, so the words we use sometimes influence yeah. the way we think. That's right. And that word lost, I do think. Yeah. Makes us long for it again. So if we right. get rid of it, we release it. That's it. And, and that's a refreshing way of thinking. So yeah. another thought that, that you shared in your books is just about hope, whatever season you're in. And if it feels hard, look for the hope of the future, as opposed to getting stuck on where you're at. Have you got any thoughts that maybe we didn't get into that you want to share with people? And then I always ask our guests if they have a, a, a challenge that guys can execute week to week. So guys like the do something side of things, they like to be proactive. They like to engage. So, okay. Thoughts yeah, and a so, challenge. Um, I would say, you know, as far as, um, you know, hope goes, 
there's nothing, no circumstance, no situation outside of God's ability to redeem it and to transform. So, you know, that there is hope in that. We don't want to have toxic hope, right? But the hope that we have in God's ability to work in us and through us is, um, there's no end to it. It's infinite. And so I think it's important to just recognize that um, no situation is hopeless. Everything is fixable. Even situations that seem, right, insurmountable, God is able. And so to not give up. Um, but it will, it'll be a journey sometimes. And that's okay. And then just as far as a challenge goes, um, I would I would challenge each man who's listening to really, I think it begins with having a more open and curious mindset to ask yourself, what story am I telling myself about this trigger or this situation or about my wife right now? Because whatever you think, like I came home from work, the house is a mess. She doesn't care about my needs is one story you could tell yourself. And so to get into the habit of asking yourself, pause before you speak out and say, what's the story I'm telling myself? And could the opposite story be just as true or even more true about this situation right now? Because the story could be my, you know, her, one of the boys got sick and she's been dealing with, you know, throw up. And she didn't, wasn't able to get the dinner. The story could be the dinner's not ready because the, we were going to barbecue and the propane was out. And oh gosh, I was supposed to do that. And I didn't do it. And actually that's on me. Like, <laughs> right. Like there could be all kinds of stories we could tell ourselves. Um, and they may not necessarily be true. And so I think being in the habit of that in every area of your life allows you to be humble and open and receptive to what the truth really is and allow us to have more compassion for others. So just the habit of asking yourself and maybe even jotting it down, you know, take one, one situation every day for the next week. One situation, what was it? Came home, house was a mess. Story I told myself was this. Um, the story that could be true or truer is this. And just keeping a log for seven days of what are the stories I've been telling myself and what's really the truth behind the situation or what could I be open and curious about believing is true. Mm, that is a fantastic challenge and writing things down, man, does it make you process that stuff and think through it? I absolutely love it. Love it. Love it. You can find, I got one more cool thing that I think will happen here in a second, but uh, you can find Amber's books all over the place. Super easy to find Amazon. She's got her website. I think your website's amberlea.com. It is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So very easy to find the website spelled just the way we spelled it in the show notes and earlier in the show. But before we close this one out this week, would you have got the greatest prayers and guy does too in your books? So like you're, you hit the topic and then you'll do a, like an actual real prayer yeah. that some of them sound like they're the exact moment in your family and time and you're praying for this one specific kid or, yep. or yourself so that you can get past something. But the way that you pray is unbelievable. And the impact you had on me, it was just a small phraseology. I didn't ask you whether you did this or didn't do this, but uh, you said, Hey, in a voice over, over messenger, you said, Hey, is there anything, Dan, that I can pray for you? And this is the part that blew me away this month. Yeah. So we didn't know each other at all. And out of nowhere, not only pray for me, like in this second, I'll do this quick prayer, but it was, what can I pray for you this month? And then after that exchange, I'd gone to about three different meetings the same day and told that story to a hundred people. <laughs> I'm like, this was the kindest, amazing, awesome. It, filled me with emotion of gratitude mm -hmm. and a uh, sense of what a great God we have and yeah. how there are lots and lots and lots mm -hmm. of great people in the world. If we just have our eyes and ears open yeah. and, you know, look for that. So guys, this is my challenge for you. You can be that person also. Yeah. So you can be the person that people go, wow, that was amazing. 
Um, so Amber, thank you mm-hmm. for that yeah. amazing prayer offer that just yeah. blew me away. And uh, I appreciate it so much. So That's with that, honor. would you mind praying for I'd love to. whoever you yeah. want to pray for? Yeah, I'd love to. Let's pray. Dear God, um, you have not left us helpless. We thank you and praise you for being an ever-present help in trouble. You're right there with us on the drive home from work, as we enter the house, as we're home all day with kids, whatever our situations are, you are right there beside us making a way. Lord, you love us and you care about us. You care about our past, our present, and our future. God, we want to have a, a future that is ideal. We want to have a future that is full of healthy and good and godly relationships, especially with our spouses. God, I just pray that you would take the words that Dan and I have been talking about today and allow them to just penetrate hearts and minds in such a way that there's transformation that's lasting. God, I pray that you would encourage us to not be discouraged but instead to recognize that all of these triggers or all of these difficulties, the anger, the yelling, the criticism, that not knowing what to do, our spouse never changes. We never change. Lord, what do we do when we feel like we've kind of tried or we're, we're trying to get through to someone and they're not listening and there's no change? God, I pray that we would be humble enough to start with ourselves, to recognize, Lord, that there's a lot of work to be done within us first. And then, Lord, bring into our lives people, books, counselors, pastors, teachers that will be mentors to us to help us live life to the full as you designed. God, we are not helpless. You've given us incredible wisdom and creativity. Lord, would you let us be creative like you are creative? Help us, Lord, to have marriages that honor you where we thrive and our children do too. Lord, help us to sense your love for us very personally, very intimately. And Lord, I just pray that everything we say and do would be from the overflow of the joy that we have, Lord, knowing how much you love us unconditionally and that that would radically transform every relationship we're in. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I didn't prepare you for that at all. So I love the fact that you can just rip off an awesome prayer like that <laughs> at the drop of a hat. Yeah, my pleasure. It's uh, it's it's like you, Dan, you mentioned, you just always these little moments of where you stop and you're just praying. It's just a con- constant conversation with the Lord. And I know that he's listening and that he'll hear, he, he is hearing the hearts of your listeners too. Yeah, yeah. So guys, if you felt a little tinge of I can't do that, it's just, as Amber said earlier, the next, the next best thing, the next right thing. So it's not that you can't pray constantly. It's just do it right now. And then you'll get better and better and better. And you'll be stepping into that and realize, huh, look how far I've come along. I've really stepped into this as opposed to the natural reaction of, I can't do that. Right. Because you can. All right. Well, thank you guys. For listening, look forward to you guys catching it next week. Uh, do check out Amber's books. They're really, really, really good. Just written in real life format with things that you can do and things you can be proactive with. Share these with your wife. I don't think she'll feel uh, like you're forcing her to read something, uh, but read it first yourself. Read it first yourself. Don't stick a book in somebody's face and tell them to read it. Mm-hmm. Read, give it to you out of, hey, I was just reading this yeah. book and Maybe if you get the paper book, you've got some notes in it. Awesome. It's a lot easier to read somebody else's book that you know they've already put some work in and you can Mm -hmm. see what their thoughts were, the things that they thought were important. Uh, And don't uh, don't highlight the stuff that you want to point out to your wife about her. (laughs) Right. Good advice, Dan. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you guys. And Amber, thank you so, so much for just being open and sharing. And I love that your books where you, you know, bring up your own stuff and, and share how you've worked through things and aren't coming from that ivory tower position talking down to everybody you're right there right there with us right there (laughs) with us so yeah we're linking arms together on these issues yeah for sure all right well fantastic thank you dan for having me i so appreciate it and appreciate you you too you too bye-bye bye